Robert Monroe was an American radio broadcasting executive who was known for his work in the field of altered states of consciousness. He founded the Monroe Institute for the Exploration of Human Consciousness, patented Hemisync by Neural Beats, and coined the term out-of-body experience. Monroe wrote several books about his astral travels out of body, the beings he met in the spirit world, and the information they imparted to him. Perhaps the most notable of all occurs in chapter 12 of his book Far Journeys, where he describes an out-of-body experience with a being who shared a creation story claiming earth was made as a garden to grow louche. This entity claimed that beings reminiscent of the Gnostic Archons allegedly require, like, need, value, collect, drink, eat, or use as a drug a substance called louche. Natural forms of this vital substance valued by these beings was said to originate from a series of vibrational actions in the carbon-oxygen cycle. So, the creator decided to grow his own in a garden experiment. Robert Monroe explains that, first, he created a proper environment for the carbon-oxygen cycle where it would flourish. He created a balance with much care, so that proper radiation and other nourishment would be in continuous supply. He then tried his first crop, which actually did produce louche, but only in small quantities and of comparatively low grade. It turns out the lifespan of the crops were too short and the crop units themselves too small bringing about limits in quality and quantity. Also, the louche could only be harvested at the moment of death and not a second before. As the story goes, the creator planted a second crop, which was only marginally better. He changed the environment to another part of the garden where the density was gaseous rather than liquid, and the higher density chemicals formed a solid base and thus were still available. He planted numberless units in many varieties in a new form with great increase in size, some many thousands of times larger and more complex than the simple unicellular first crop. This second crop reseeded itself at regular intervals and terminated their lifespans automatically. The creator also immobilized this second crop to avoid the uneven distribution of chemicals and radiation prevalent in the first crop. Each was designed to stay principally in its own section of the garden. To this end, each was given firm tendrils which burrowed deep in the more dense chemical matter. Attached to this was a stem, or trunk, which helped elevate the upper portion upward for its share of needed radiation. The upper portion, broad, thin, and somewhat fragile, was designed as a transducer of carbon-oxygen compounds to and from the crop unit. As an added thought, brilliant color radiators accompanied by small particle generators were mounted on each unit usually near the top, and symmetrically centered. In other words, the first crop was the creation of unicellular organisms, and the second crop was the creation of trees, flowers, and plants. According to Monroe, the creator was still unsatisfied with the results of the second crop, which produced more quantity, but of no greater quality. He did, however, discover a new means of swift harvesting, through what sounds like strong winds, hurricanes, or tornadoes. He set up circulating patterns in the gaseous envelope around the crop principally to aid in the reseeding process. Later, he discovered that the same turbulent effect served as a means of harvesting the louche. If the turbulence were violent enough, the crop would be blown down, the lifespan terminated, and the louche would discharge. After his second failure, the creator hovered over his garden pondering how he would change his third crop. He decided the original carbon-oxygen cycle must be included, mobility must be restored, and size must be added to the units. Thus the creator removed some sample units from the first crop still thriving in the liquid portion of his garden, and modified them to exist in the gaseous area. Then he adapted them to take nourishment from the second crop to allow them to grow into efficient louche collectors themselves. Thus it was that the first of the mobiles, the third crop, came into being. The mobiles took nourishment from the second crop, thus ending its lifespan, and produced low-grade louche. When each huge mobile terminated its own lifespan, additional louche was produced. The quantity was massive, but the frequency pattern of the louche residue 
still left much to be desired. So, the third crop was larger mobile units that feed upon the second crop, or in other words, animals were created to further refine the louche production of plants. The creator was getting closer and closer to a viable louche garden, but his new problem was that the monstrous and slow-moving mobiles had a lifespan far out of proportion to their nourishment input. The growth and life termination process was of such length that soon the mobiles would all but decimate the second crop. The entire garden would be out of balance, and there would be no louche production whatsoever. While hovering over his third crop and pondering his next move, the creator noticed as the second crop plants grew more and more scarce, the energy needs of the third crop animals became acute. Often, two mobiles would seek to ingest the same second crop unit, causing conflict and physical struggle, which, to the creator's happy surprise, created huge amounts of louche. With this new revelation in mind, the creator tried another experiment. He removed another unit of the first crop from the liquid garden area, redesigned it for the gaseous environment, but with one significant change. The new mobile unit would be somewhat smaller, but would require the ingestion of other mobiles for nourishment. This would solve the problem of overpopulation of mobiles, and at the same time would create good quantities of usable louche during each conflict struggle, plus a bonus if the new class of mobile terminated the lifespan of the other. In other words, for the fourth crop, the creator made carnivorous animals who, in their struggle to survive, harvested record amounts of louche. For his fourth crop units, the creator tried a few different types. Some were made to subsist mostly on the second crop units, while others required the energy from ingestion of their fellow third crop units. The completed circuit operated quite satisfactorily. The stationary second crop modification in the liquid environment flourished. Small, highly active, liquid-breathing mobiles took nourishment and ate the second crop modification. Larger and or other active mobiles consumed for energy the smaller plant eaters, when any mobile grew too large and slow, it became an easy target for the smaller mobiles, who attacked in voracious numbers. The chemical residue from these ingestive actions settled to the bottom of the liquid medium, and so provided new nourishment for the stationaries, completing the circuit. The result was a steady flow of louche. From the lifespan termination of the stationaries, from the intense conflict among the mobiles to avoid ingestion, and finally, from the sudden termination of the lifespans of such mobiles as the inevitable product of such conflicts. The garden was now producing adequate louche, and self-regenerating as well. Even still, the creator was not finished refining his crops, and had more ingenious ideas in mind. He created thousands of new types in his fourth crop mobiles, with the goal of more struggle, suffering, and conflict. These took the form of mass, elusive speed, deceptive and or protective coating, and color radiation, wave action, and particle perceptors and detectors, and unique higher-density protuberances for gouging, grasping, and rending during conflict. In other words, he created faster, larger, stronger animals with claws, fangs, and antlers to hunt and kill one another. These new additions prolonged the periods of conflict and resulted in increased louche production. Next, as a side experiment, the creator designed one form of mobile that was weak and ineffective by the standards of the other mobiles in the fourth crop. Yet, this experimental mobile had two distinct advantages. The first advantage was its ability to ingest and take energy from both the stationaries and other mobiles. Second, the creator pulled forth a piece of himself, with no other source of such substance being known or available, to act as an intensive, ultimate trigger to mobility. By infusing this piece of himself into the fourth crop units, the creator added a new motivating force beyond the satisfaction of energy requirements through ingestion. These units would now always seek to satisfy this tiny moat of the creator engendered as it sought reunion with the infinite whole. This piece of himself sounds like consciousness or higher mind, and the special fourth crop units given this gift are humans. 
After endowing us with humanity, the Creator began designing violent harvesting methods to generate extra amounts of louche. To reap such harvest, the collectors generated storms of turbulence and turmoil in both the gaseous envelope and the more solid chemical formations that were the base of the garden itself. Such upheavals had the effect of terminating lifespans of multitudes of the fourth crop as they were crushed under the rolling base formation or smothered under waves from the agitated liquid area of the garden. In other words, natural disasters like earthquakes, volcanoes, floods, and tsunamis were purposely introduced to periodically aid in louche harvesting. Increasingly satisfied with his garden, the creator hovered above watching his creations and noticed certain fourth crop units emanating a type of the highest quality purified and distilled louche. Intensely curious, he investigated the source and found this most desirable louche was coming from one particular unit. The fourth crop unit was not struggling in conflict over an ingestible remnant of a weaker fourth crop unit, or a tasty frond from a nearby second crop stem, or to avoid termination of life and ingestion by the other conflicting fourth crop unit. It was in conflict to protect and save from life termination three of its own newly generated species huddled under a large second crop unit, waiting for the outcome. To translate into normal language, the creator noticed a human parent fighting to protect its three young children under a large tree, and it was this intense emotional defense of their loved ones that created a purified and distilled type of louche energy. Continuing to observe the fourth crop units in his garden, the creator noticed another unit also producing purified louche, but this one was alone and seemingly not in conflict at all. Investigating closer, the creator found that this individual standing alone under the leafy upper portion of a large second crop unit was not hungry, not in conflict, and not acting in defense of its young, but still producing high-quality louche energy. The unit was lonely. It turns out loneliness also acts as a great catalyst to louche production, so the creator made a brilliant revision to his formula. He split all fourth crop units into new type 4M units with male and female halves to engender loneliness as they sought to reunite. From experience, the collectors have evolved an entire technology with complementary tools for the harvesting of louche from the type 4M units. The most common have been named love, friendship, family, greed, hate, pain, guilt, disease, pride, ambition, ownership, possession, sacrifice. And on a larger scale, nations, provincialism, wars, famine, religion, machines, freedom, industry, trade, to list a few. Louche production is higher than ever before. Robert Monroe's interaction with the entity ended abruptly there. If this creation story is true, it appears that the existence of plants, animals, humans, and the entire earth itself are all simply to feed our creators. If we were ultimately designed not by a loving, benevolent God, as most religions preach, but rather by a race of malevolent super-beings, like the Gnostic Archons, this provides unique answers to certain metaphysical questions. For example, why is there so much pain, suffering, disease, and death? Why is Earth plagued with an abundance of various natural disasters? And why does life feed upon life in a destructive cycle of survival? If all of these things produce a kind of nourishment for other entities, then such seemingly negative circumstances only appear that way to us. For the entities that created us, our suffering would likely be no more concerning than that of an ant colony under their feet. Isabella Green said, Louche is what human beings produce when in emotional turmoil, fear, guilt, unworthiness, war, conflict, pain, drama, and suffering of all gradations. Guilt, unworthiness, and suffering have been normalized as a part of the human experience and are promoted from all directions. Just think about the ideas so common in our reality that we no longer notice, such as no pain, no gain, love hurts, not worth it if you didn't suffer for it, etc. The inferiority of the human race to the handlers 
is promoted in religious texts, which makes people look up to them and be eager to do whatever they say. Unworthiness is also the foundation on which most of the present-day industrial complexes stand and is heavily utilized in marketing. If we zoom out and closely examine our key beliefs on earth, we will see that these beliefs prepare people for submission to the suggestions of the handlers when we face them after death. The handlers shepherd the souls in and out of their physical bodies, and use the tactics of convincing them to continue physical experiences on earth while utilizing love, guilt, unworthiness, and suffering. Howdy Mikowski wrote, In chapter 12 of his book Far Journeys, Robert Monroe presents an out-of-body experience where he met a being of light who provided him with details of our realm. The being described the earth as a giant experiment for the creator beings to build the perfect loosh harvest system. Loosh being a word Monroe coined to mean a specific type of harvestable energy that the creator beings, demiurge and archons, require. While some energy is harvested while beings are still alive, the majority is taken at their death. This energy is claimed to be used by the Demiurge and Archons to extend their own lifespans. I would argue that this phrase, placed into computer terms, means that the energy goes into the computer simulation power grid to keep it running, hence extend the life of the simulation. In order to have this occur, a garden was created by these beings to farm their food source. Our world is one that is dominated by what we call the food chain, a need to eat other things to survive. Monroe presents that the food chain has only been set up to maximize louche at death. No creature can survive long on earth or in this realm without eating something. A vegetarian may think eating a carrot is not the same as eating a duck, but each are living organisms who are only here to be a part of the louche farm, and their death is the same as any other creature's death from that perspective. If a good God creator was really the only one who set up this place, and if energy was needed to help keep it running, a much better system could have been developed. People try to ignore this problem, but it is critical to see that the only reason a food chain exists is because it comes from the mind of that which is evil.